Welcome to Toyota Time with Timmy the Toolman and Sean. What we have for you today is another modification to a third gen Toyota 4Runner. If you're like Sean and I and you plan on off-roading your vehicle, extra heavy duty skid plates are something to consider because when you're four-wheeling you might be going over a rocky terrain and you might hit something that's going to damage your undercarriage whether it's your engine like oil pan or maybe your transfer case or transmission so extra heavy duty skid plates are going to help protect the underneath of your drivetrain so which skid plates did i choose well since i already bought myself a front cbi bumper and a rear cbi bumper and i also bought cbi rock rails i decided to go ahead and buy cbi skid plates so what they make is a skid plate for the front that protects the area of the radiator and motor area and then the back skid plate protects the area of the transmission and transfer case so it goes all the way from the front cross member in front of the radiator all the way back to the rear cross member behind the transfer case now the skid plates that CBI make don't protect the underside of your vehicle 100% there's one other known Achilles heel of underneath your vehicle and that's the gas tank the OEM gas tank skid is not all that burly It's not that strong and I've actually seen it on somebody's truck that I've helped work on that He did take a hit and the skid plate was bent really bad and the gas tank ended up getting dented really bad, too So that is a vulnerable area that you want to protect also so I decided to add one of those skid plates as well and I found this good one that's made by this company called Little Skips. We already made a video of that install. If you click on the link above, you can see that skid plate and how we installed it on a third generation Toyota 4Runner. With all that said, let's start by showing you all the necessary fasteners to get the front and middle skid plates onto the rig. Here's the fasteners that you need for the front skid plate. You have three M8 bolts with a 125 pitch. The instructions say that you just reuse your factory ones. These aren't factory ones. I replaced the original ones because I wanted ones just a little bit longer. So these are actually an M8 bolt with a 125 pitch and they're 30 millimeters long. They're similar to these that CBI provides for the bolt holes further back. Now, there's an interesting story about this one. This is actually an M9 bolt with the 125 pitch. When I bought my rig and I decided to do some maintenance on it, when I went to remove the skid plate, I noticed that the center bolt was broken off. I tried to drill it out and I ended up damaging the threads. So I was thinking, well, I'll just drill it out to the next size, which is a M9 with a 125 pitch. What I didn't know at the time is finding an M9 bolt with a 125 pitch is next to impossible. Nobody makes it. Doing a little research online, I did find a place on the East Coast in Detroit, Michigan that actually sells them, but they're not all that affordable. This little bolt cost me $18 and the company that sold it to me has a two bolt minimum. So I had to buy at least two bolts at $18 a piece plus shipping. So lesson learned, maybe don't drill out and go to an M9 size if you have this problem, but it seemed logical, but now I know better. The next two fasteners in line are also an M8 bolt with a 125 pitch, 30 millimeters in length, and they give you these half inch spacers. And when we install the skid plate, we'll show you the reason for the spacers. The final two fasteners for the front skid plate are a button head bolt, with the flange nut and a washer and I added a couple extra additional washers as spacers and I'll show you the reason for those when it comes time to installing it. These are all the fasteners you need for the rear skid plate. The frontmost ones again are a button head Allen head bolt with a flange nut and a washer and these two actually affix the front skid plate to the rear skid plate so that's what these are for. The next fasteners in line are a carriage bolt with the fender washer and then a regular round washer and a flange nut. And these attach the skid plate to the cross member that's right underneath the transmission. So there's two for that application. The final three fasteners are again, a carriage bolt with the fender washer, 
with uh, another round washer and a flange nut and these are to affix the rear skid plate to the backmost cross member and these are all the fasteners you need to get the skid plates attached to your third generation Toyota 4Runner. So here's what the skid plates look like. This is the front skid plate. This is how it will go up actually underneath the vehicle. This is the side that faces the engine. These are the front three mounting holes that attach the skid plate to the cross member right in front of the radiator. These two right here, there's two M8 bolts that will attach right here. And then these two holes right here are to attach the front skid plate to the rear skid plate. So that's where all those fasteners go. This is the skid plate in the rear or the middle skid plate. These two holes right here is where you join up the front skid plate to the rear skid plate. Then you have these two holes and this is where the skid plate attaches to the cross member underneath the transmission. And then you have these final three back holes which attaches to the rear cross member near the transfer case. You'll notice right here, there's a little rubbing marks right here. I already had these skid plates on my vehicle and we took them off so we can show you the install. There's a little rub points here. This area is where the transfer case little skid plate attaches. So this is letting me know that I probably should just remove that little skid plate on the bottom side of the transfer case to get it out of the way so it's not rubbing there anymore. The first step is to remove your OEM skid plates. We're not going to show up because we have faith that you already know how to do this. It's really simple. A few 12 millimeter bolts and the sucker's off. So get that done first and then we'll show you how to get the CBI skid plates in position and bolt it up. One thing that I haven't showed you just yet that comes with this skid plate set is this bracket that attaches to the steering rack. It has two mounting points. It attaches to this collar on the steering rack on the passenger side and then it attaches on the driver's side with the big nut and bolt that goes through the cross member. So all you have to do is take off this flange nut, release this flange nut on this side, you slide the bracket over those studs, and then you re-tighten and torque them the spec. This bigger flange nut on the driver's side is torqued to 141 foot-pounds. And on the passenger side, this smaller flange nut is torqued to 123 foot-pounds. These things are super heavy. In order to make it easier to get the skid plate in position underneath the rig and get the bolt holes lined up, do yourself a favor and use some type of hydraulic jack. This is a transmission jack. If you don't have a transmission jack with like a wide base like this, then what I would recommend is taking a regular hydraulic jack getting a piece of plywood to disperse the load to support it more evenly and then use that to get it in place and lift it up into position. These suckers are heavy so protect your back, get it on here, and then now roll it underneath the vehicle. You just want the load to be distributed pretty evenly so it's not so tippy. So I can tell that I have it balanced pretty good right now. So now I can jack it up and start getting the bolt holes lined up. Once you have all three holes lined up on the front cross member, then get some bolts started. It ends up that these M8 bolts with the 125 pitch that CBI provides, it also the ones that I bought myself, a half inch socket fits it really well. You could also use a 13 millimeter, that would work too. And with all these, we want to keep them loose right now. We don't want anything tight just yet because we want some movement in this skid plate to make sure we can get everything else lined up. The next fasteners going backward incorporate this half inch spacer. So you slide the spacer in between the skid plate and the frame member and line it up with the hole. Then you grab another one of these M8 bolts that are 30 millimeters long and get it started. like so and then you just do the same with the other side now that we have all those fasteners holding the skid plate in place we can get the jack out of our way now we're gonna get the rear skid plate onto here 
and slide it in place. Before we raise the rear skid plate in place, we're going to get this OEM little skid out of the way because we did note that it was rubbing. You could actually see where it was rubbing, right here and right here. So this little skid plate is held on by four 12 millimeter bolts. Two 12 millimeter bolts on the front, two 12 millimeter bolts on the back, one here and one here on either side of the drive shaft. Pretty easy to remove. Now that we have that small little OEM transfer case skid plate out of the way, now we're gonna raise the rear skid plate into position. So remember earlier I said that I was going to use a couple washers as spacers. So see this gap right here? I thought I would have this bracket all the way down onto the stud, but maybe there's a chance that when I tighten it, it moved a little bit. And so it's not sitting as far down as it possibly could. And that could be the reason why there's a little bit of a gap here. So instead of releasing the bolt, and trying to retorque it, I just decided to use a couple washers to take up a little gap so the metal doesn't necessarily have to bend into place. So I just slid in a couple M8 size washers. So now with those two spacer washers lined up with the hole, I'm gonna slide the button head bolt with another washer through here and get the flange nut on top. And I'm going to do the same with the other side. In regards to which skid plate goes on the top and which goes on the bottom, it makes sense that the rear skid plate goes on the top for a couple reasons. Number one, when you're four wheeling, you're most likely going to be going forward more than you're going to be going reverse. So as you're dragging over a rock, you wouldn't want this lip to catch as you're going forward. So it's, it's better to have the rear skid plate up above the front skid plate. Another thing is, is that if you're doing maintenance on your rig, you're going to be doing oil changes more often than you're going to be changing transmission and transfer case fluid. So there's another reason why you want the rear skid plate on the top and the front skid plate on the bottom because this way you'll have an easier time getting the front skid plate off because you don't have to first remove the rear skid plate. So we kind of installed it in reverse but we were able to easily tilt it up at an angle and get the front of the skid plate slid over the front skid plate and then we'll bolt it in place so you could actually put the front skid plate on first it's not that big of a deal so the front and rear skid plate are attached with a button head bolt washer on the bottom and a flange nut on the top the next fastener is in line attached the back skid plate to the cross member underneath the transmission. You come in through the bottom with the carriage bolt, slide it through the hole in the skid, slide it through the cross member, then you grab one of these fender washers, you slide that on top, and then this one's a little bit hard to get to because you have the catalytic converter in your way, so it's a little bit challenging. You have to put a washer next and then your flange nut. The next three fasteners are again a carriage bolt that comes in from underneath, goes through the skid plate and through the cross member. You get another fender washer on top. You get a washer on top of that. And then you get your flange nut. And then you just do the same with the other two mounting holes and you're ready to tighten everything up. Everywhere you're using a carriage bolt, the flange nut on top is a 14 millimeter. What I found is the best tool to tighten those flange nuts with is a flex head ratcheting wrench. It makes it nice and easy. So the way the carriage bolt is, it's not gonna spin because it gets caught in the slot here. So you just have to go up on top and tighten it up with your 14 millimeter. For the button head bolts, this is a 7 16 head, 
So what I did, I just got on it with the regular 7 16 Allen wrench and then went on the backside again with this 14 millimeter flex head ratcheting wrench and tighten it from the backside. Here's what the skid plates look like starting from the front going backwards. You can see how the front skid plate attaches to the cross member right in front of the radiator so it's protecting your radiator really nicely and then going underneath it's protecting the underside of your engine. Going further backwards you can see that CBI puts a hole in the bottom of the skid plate so you can access your oil pan drain bolt. Going further backwards you can see how nicely it protects the underside of the transmission. Going further backwards, you can see how it protects underneath the transfer case all the way back to that rear cross member. So here's where it ends, right at the rear cross member. Here's a shot of what the skid plates look like going from the rear looking forward. You can see how well it's going to protect all the vital parts of your drivetrain. The engine, the transmission, and the transfer case. Alright, we're all done with the installation of a CBI front and rear skid plate for a third generation Toyota 4Runner. The installation is pretty straightforward. You first get that bracket attached to the steering rack. And then the next logical step is to get the rear skid plate in place because that one's going to go on top of the front skid plate. If you messed up and you got the front skid plate in first, no big deal. You just angle the rear skid plate up to the lip, comes over the top, and then you jack it up into place. I'm sure there's a torque spec for these skid plate bolts. I've never bothered torquing skid plate bolts. I just get them nice and tight by feel and call it good. You might find that the threads are a little bit sticky on some of these. And so a good tool is a thread restore kit. I'll put a link in the video description because I've actually used that on this rig. It basically just rechases the threads, doesn't cut new threads, but basically cleans them and sort of reshapes them to where it's easier to get your bolt started. That might be a nice kit to have in your possession when you're working on your rig. In regards to skid plates, there's pluses and minuses to them. The obvious plus is you have extra protection on your rig when you're four wheeling. The downside is, is you have those heavy skid plates now in your way from doing regular maintenance like oil changes and transmission fluid changes and transfer case fluid changes. So it's just a little bit more work to get those suckers out of your way so you can do the fluid changes. But it's a good thing to have, especially if you're going to four wheeling. If you don't go four wheeling, I wouldn't suggest getting these because you really don't need them. And the people looking at you while you're cruising the mall aren't going to see them anyways because they're underneath the rig so there's no style points for skid plates unless you're going to be running over the top of people which maybe that's your thing i don't know anyways thank you for watching toyota time with timmy the tool man and sean we will be back with more videos thank you for watching thank you for subscribing if you have any questions or comments do that below take care bye bye